Welcome to Books and Booze, a bookish and wine and juice podcast. Around the holidays, we try and mix things up on Books and Booze. We do true crime special episodes. As our podcast is predominantly about thriller books, we are huge fans of true crime. Please note that these episodes are often graphic and very explicit, not suitable for all audiences. Buckle up, brace yourself. Hello everyone, we are joined here today by Kate and Leanne, who are two fellow murderinos. Do you guys want to tell a little bit about yourselves? Sure, so my name's Kate. I first actually got into true crime because I was really into Goosebump books when I was a kid <laughs> and I kind of progressed um, into like Stephen King novels and really loved the kind of horror theme, got into horror movies and then kind of was my gateway into um, true crime stories. Can, and can I in. ask you, do you like It by Stephen King? It actually took me about 12 months to read that book <laughs> because I kept having to put it away because I had <laughs> so many bad dreams. But yeah, that was definitely one of my favorites. Um, my mom got that book on a book club membership when I was eight and I read it when I was eight and I was confused mm-hmm. and horrified and enchanted all the how same did time. You, how did you read it when you were eight? <laughs> Jesus. My, yeah, we didn't have to be where I grew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, we, we were not allowed to watch M-rated movies when we were kids at all, but I went to a friend's birthday party. I was seven. It was her eighth birthday, and their mum put on Halloween uh, as the movie so that was my first horror movie experience which oh, gave me nightmares for a very long time I've never seen Halloween I really must because apparently the new ones out now oh there's they've remade it many times yeah. so I think there's yeah been the latest one come out recently but um but yes it, Stephen King was my gateway and then got really into true crime and just really loved the stories and really loved the Manson family stories and I even had a pen pal who was a serial killer on what? death row in the US when I was 19. Yeah. <laughs> so I found this website when I was 19 called prisonpenpals.com mm-hmm. and um, asked my dad, hey, can I just use your PO box so I can um, be pen pals with this guy on death row? And he was like, sure. Um, <laughs> no further questions asked. So, um, yeah. this Such got- a dad move. You're like, I don't know how to answer this question, so that's fine. He was very supportive of my interest. So, um, <laughs> yeah, and I always feel that it's a real you. It's a real murderino that you meet when you come. When I tell that story, because most people will say, jump to the um, conclusion that you that I wanted to like hook up with him, mm. and I'm like, no, 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 I wanted to get to his head. Like yeah. I really wanted to, yeah, so kind what, of figure out what made him tick. What was so, he on death row for? He killed five women. She, yeah, like, like rape. Yeah, sexual yeah. assault and murder, murdered them. It was before Google, so it was really hard to find information about him at the time. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, he'd killed like his the first murder he committed when he was seventeen years old, and he was caught when he was twenty two. I'm sorry, I've never heard of something like this. So like, like, what do you, what did you guys like write about? But he didn't really talk about the crimes. He used to write me lots of poetry mm, and shit. do sketches and things like that. Yeah. Um, it was really hard to write because you had to send them paper and pens and envelopes. And I couldn't get American stamps here. So I okay. had to wait for him to be able to trade in the prison to be able to send. Did he know back. what yeah. you looked like? No, I used a fake name. Okay. And, yeah, no, I was very smart about it. <laughs> fake well, name and a PO then, box. Yeah, like in prisons they didn't have, like it was all by post. And so like they wouldn't, unless you sent him like a physical picture, he wouldn't. No, no, nothing like that. I was very careful about yeah, it. So scary. Okay. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was where my obsession was born. Okay, yeah. Cool. When I discovered um, true crime podcasts, it was just like a dream come true. So so exciting to be on one. Yeah. <laughs> what about you? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. My name is Leanne. I'm from the states, from the U.S. South, which is the when we say that we mean the southeast, not Texas. Um, Florida's part of it, but a different we call it a different south my I'm actually like a fourth generation at least margarino (laughs) um I remember my great-grandmother we called nanny she had a police radio in her house and like she has this amazing she had this crazy brain where she always the police radio was always 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 on and so she could hear the live feed of like when they were going to a fire 
or a break-in or whatever, domestic or whatever. And she would also be doing like a crossword puzzle and watching NASCAR, like car races, <laughs> and carrying on a conversation all at the same time. And um, she was super amazing. And I remember like sort of that police radio being like the background of my childhood because I, my... Uh, my mom was very young. She was like 15 when she had me, so it was mostly raised by my grandma and my great grandma. And they were both super murderinos. So there was the police radio all the time. And then my grandmother was a murderino. She would like wa- read all the true crime books. So we had like the Richard Ramirez book, like all of this in the 80s when I was growing up. And then when Court TV came out, like the OJ Simpson trial was like game changer for her. She was like, court tv addict like it was on 24 7 at her house it was non-stop and she had all these theories she would like film out of her apartment window because she we lived in the urban south um which is very different than rural south like a lot of people think of like hee-haw sort of like down on the farm sort of south and that was (laughs) (laughs) ours was more like prostitutes and crackheads and um beautiful (laughs) <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the urban south. <laughs> More like the the show Oz than the Wizard of Oz. I see. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I just cut my teeth on reading true crime books at my grandma's house. We didn't have TV when I was a kid until, of course, court TV. Yeah, my – actually, I found out about my favorite murder. I got into murder podcasts through my husband. We'd been, we started listening to podcasts because um, I missed NPR, which is in the States, which is like National Public Radio, which is just like a talk radio. Um, and they had funny shows and interesting shows, whatever. Um, and he found My Favorite Murder and was like, I'm not super into it, but I think you'll love, like, they sound just like you. They, <laughs> they think the same things are funny. It's fucked up and you'll love it. So <laughs> listen to this. And they speak your language. Yeah. That's perfect. <laughs> So that's how I got into it. And then being a relative newcomer in Brisbane and feeling really lonely and not feeling like I was connecting with a lot of people, um, joined the Murderinos, Brisbane Murderinos group. Yep. And now I'm here. In my this. house. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for knives. <laughs> Because we have cheese. There's cheese. Yeah, there's yeah. multiple cheeses. There's a cheese now. <laughs> We're having like a murderino party with wine and cheese and olives and some strange, funny nut things that are actually really delicious. What are they called? Boiled peanuts. Boiled peanuts. So uh, in the South, on. we don't just roast the peanuts. We boil them, fall on the shells with salt, and um, and they taste like, yeah, they taste like beans. So look, besides the sodium, like, that would actually be kind of healthy. Sure. <laughs> no. no. Am I? No. Everyone's looking at me. I don't know what the sodium <laughs> content is, but let's go with yes. Okay. I think pretty sodium's a vitamin, right? At least where I come from. To an extent. (laughs) I think to an extent. I just have a salt lick in my house. So So, uh, obviously everyone kind of knows me if you've been here for a while. But um, I don't know if anyone actually knows the story of how I got into my favorite murder. So I'll say it very quickly. I met a dude on Tinder um, who I now live with and will hopefully marry and have his babies. Yeah, um, I met him for like two days and then didn't see him for a long time and then uh, flew to Canada to go live in a camper van with him for a while and travel Canada in a camper van in the middle of winter and he got me into into case file mm, and I was so awesome. absolutely hooked and then as soon as I'd binged all of case file I was just like I need more there must be more podcasts out there so then I, I don't know how, I don't know what day it was, but I somehow stumbled across my favourite murder and it changed my entire life. Um, everything that's happened in my life since then has kind of been because of my favourite murder. So I've made friends, I've started a podcast because of my favourite murder, my co-host Kiara, uh, we met because we're both book-loving murderinos, so yes. But today we are here with two other murderinos, Kate and Leanne, who you just met, and we are going to talk about Easter crimes because it's happy fucking Easter, people. And yes, you can swear on the podcast. Great. I was going to ask because <laughs> I did it by accident, and then I we just, I'm like, oh, sh- and then I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> no, you, you can say cunt if you want to. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we just say explicit. Let's proceed. Yes. <laughs>
Okay, so the first person, we've kind of divided this because while we're going to try, obviously with true crime, we always want to be respectful to victims and their families and friends and fiancés. And we also want to try and make light and just show what absolute idiots the murderers can be sometimes <laughs> or just how <laughs> stupid they are and whatever. Um, so we're going to start with Kate, who has one that I thought sounded pretty funny, but it's actually really very disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> like most murders. <laughs> and then we've got mine, which is pretty horrific. I'm going to try and bring some lightness into it, but, you know, it is pretty devastating. And then we're ending with Leanne, who's got a more funny one. So hopefully we're going to end on a high. So on that note, take it away, Kate. <laughs> So I am covering Catherine Knight, which uh, Catherine was the first woman in Australia to be convicted of um, and sentenced to life in prison. So it is a bit of a stretch making it an Easter one, but I figure the murder t- took place very close to Easter, so it's close enough. That's right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is one of, the, and also there's a book called Bloodstain by Peter Layla. Um, which was one of the first true crime books that I ever read and definitely the first Australian true crime book that I ever read. It's absolutely fantastic book and probably the best source if you want to read more about Catherine Knight. I'll start talking a bit about her early life. So her mother, uh, her mother Barbara Knight, was initially, before she was married to Catherine's father, she was actually married to another man named Jack and they both worked, uh, they lived in Aberdeen in New South Wales, very close to the Hunter Valley and um, they had four children together, and Barbara had an affair with one of Jack's friends, who was Ken Knight. So um, Barbara left Jack with all the kids and took off with Ken. Um, <laughs> yeah. We've yeah. all thought about it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the two older kids stayed with Jack. The two younger kids went to um, their aunt's house in Sydney. Um, but Barbara and Ken moved out to Moree, and together they had four more kids. Whoa. Yes. Despite the names of uh, Barbara and Ken, this was not a Barbie and Ken relationship (laughs) whatsoever. Um, So two of their children um, were twin girls. Catherine was one of those uh, girls born in 1955. And Ken was a severe alcoholic, very, very abusive, um, and would rape their mother on a daily basis um, in front of the children, sometimes up to 10 times a day. 10 times a day? 10 times a day, yeah. That's yep. disgusting. So, um, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do this first because it was supposed to be kind of bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an interesting story. Let's, like, leave it at that. Um, so, so in 1959, Catherine was four. Jack died, so that's her mother's ex-husband, mm. and the two elder kids came to live in, in with Barbara and Ken. So six kids in that house now. And Catherine, she talks about her childhood and talks about being sexually assaulted multiple times as a child by family members, doesn't really specify who other than the fact that it was not her father. Mm -hmm. But obviously there was, like, lots of exposure to abuse um, in her early life. All the reports from school kind of say that she had a pretty normal childhood when it comes to primary school. When she was 14, they moved back to Aberdeen from Moree. So that was in 1969. She went to Musselbrook High School where she was seen to be a bit of a bully but seemed to be a really model student unless she was in this uh, kind of rage state. And that really kind of... Totally normal. Throughout her life, there's lots of people who talk about... Fine, fine, fine. Rage. (laughs) Otherwise, fine. Yes. Um, me. It was, there, was no, there was no, like, yellow light here. It was green or red or nothing mm. in between. It was So there was a couple of minor incidents. She assaulted another student with a weapon. Um, apparently she also assaulted a teacher at one stage, but it was later found to be self-defence, and I couldn't find more information about that. Mm. But I imagine they used the cane back in those days as well. Yeah. So she, anyway, she left uh, school at 15, and she was pretty much illiterate at the time that she left school. And her dream was to work at the local abattoir. Because that's where her mom and her mom's oh. first husband had worked. Living the dream. That was literally what she described as her dream job. Life goals. Yeah. Wow. So I can't imagine many 15-year-old girls, like, their dream job being to slaughter animals. You know what I need more in my life? <laughs> Random blood. And death. <laughs> so oh she was uh, She was later talked about having this di- diagnosis of necromania. So I had to look that up because at first I thought that was 
what's the one we have sex necrophilia. with? Necrophilia. Yeah. Necrophilia. So it's not that you you have an attraction to death with necromania. So you're kind of obsessed with death. And I kind of think, well, that's not a murderino, really. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm so a little attacked right now. <laughs> but that's <laughs> fine. It's fine. I feel I'm really awkward right now. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's essentially like if you think about like there's there's a lot of different like Jeffrey Dahmer for example he had this obsession with dead things because you can control dead things and they are how they are and they don't really change that was kind of goes back to her obsession with what like things that were dead so she got her dream job when she was I think she was around 16 and she was very quickly promoted and one of the big things that she was given was her own set of knives that she loved so much to the point where everywhere she moved she hung them above her bed what yes so can you imagine sexy hooking up on a tinder date going home with this really cute girl and suddenly there's a whole bunch of knives at the top of her bed and when she was asked why would you hang such knives above your bed she said it would always be handy if i needed them (laughs) <laughs> okay yes if what? we did <laughs> to say i've been into some knife play before and i kind of am like i get it a little bit but not this murdering <laughs> obviously but like Especially it's kinky. kinky. But these were the knives that she took to work every day. But not if you kill a cow with it. I yeah. think you've yeah. Don't cut my garter off with your cow. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But she was very very okay. fond of okay. these knives. So, <laughs> all right. So we'll move on to her first love. And there's four main guys that she kind of feature throughout her life. The first two are both called Dave, and the second two are both called John. Oh, so uh, she's yeah. obviously got a type. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Four letters. Now yes. Got it. Yes. Uh, so yeah. the first guy, David Kellett. So Dave number one. Um, they met in 1973, and he was a co-worker at the abattoir. So she was also known for dating men that were much smaller than her. She was about six foot one. So she well, was, yeah, yeah, everyone's small. But, but there was this, this kind of talk about. So that's Billy Jensen. Billy Jensen's six <laughs> foot four, which I found out today. Oh, lovely. Oh. Maybe they should have spent some time together. Um, <laughs> have made some but she time. seemed to purposely go for men that were smaller than her. Mm. So they met in 1973. A year later, they were married. So, uh, and this is where the violence starts, is on the wedding night. So, on the wedding night, apparently Barbara, who's Catherine's mum, pulls Dave aside on the wedding night and says to him, you better watch this one or she will fucking kill you. This is the mother of the bride. That's sweet. <laughs> yeah, so sweet. And it's nice when people know you so well. <laughs> <laughs> and on the wedding night, apparently Catherine had been told by her mother that her parents had sex five times on their wedding night. And so for her, in her mind, that was the standard. They had to have sex five times. Well, poor old Dave number one fell asleep after sex num- time number three. So <laughs> sex time, time number three. Sex time. Sexy time. Well, my sex was asleep after I was going to say, on her wedding night, aren't you? And they've been drinking, right? Exactly. <laughs> well, apparently she was completely sober up until in, she was in her 40s, but he was quite a heavy drinker. So the fact that he made it to mm. sex Chris, time number good. three. <laughs> is, he's struggling. Yeah. He's doing his Damnedest. Yeah. So yeah. he fell asleep after. He wants to make his bride a sweetheart. He, he, found, he, he fell asleep after after round three and woke up to her choking him. Mm. So she was very angry that they did not make it to five times. Although I don't really imagine wanting to hold a candle to your parents' wedding night on your wedding It's a night. little, I mean, you know. Can you get a play-by-play? <laughs> Each to their own. Um, <laughs> yeah, so shortly after, she fell pregnant. So they married in 1974. She was pregnant in 1976. And when she was pregnant, uh, apparently he came home late one night. He'd been at the pub having lots and lots of drinks, and he had won a dart competition. So he was celebrating at the pub, and he was home much later than what he said he would be. Mm, naughty boy. Yes. So when he came home, essentially he walked in the door and she hit him in the back of the head with a skillet. <laughs> yes. Okay. And actually fractured his skull. Oh, so it was <laughs> it was a <laughs> decent swing. Yeah. So it was wasn't just thing. like a love tap. No, it was not. <laughs> was time yes. management yes. is a must. So he was in hospital for a period of time. It turned out that also during this time she'd taken all of his clothes and shoes, put them in the bathtub and set them all on fire. Wow. Well, as you do. Yes, yes. That's, you know, if you're home late from the pub, I don't care about your dark competition. 
the you're gonna be hit with a skillet. Congratulations, all your stuff's gonna be <laughs> yeah. and so, your stuff. so police had come to Dave number one and asked if he would like to press charges. And apparently, um, this is what all of her partners say that she was very good at convincing them not to press charges mm. because she was very good in bed, apparently. I, I mean, it goes really far. I mean, if you Not keep knives I above your bed, <laughs> you know, yeah. If you're keeping knives above your bed, I imagine there's some yeah. kinky stuff happening to keep them happy. So apparently, essentially, she convinced him with her sexual ways <laughs> to not press charges. So in 1976, so she was pregnant during all of that as well. So she had... Oh! Yeah. Oh! Yeah, so shortly okay. after, she had her first daughter. And this is where she starts to go really insane. So and could we um, put this down to like hormonal imbalance? Or? Well, <laughs> can well, we put it down? We absolutely <laughs> could. Yes, sure, <laughs> sure, we could. Yes. Because you know, in the seventies, you were never a criminal if you're a woman. You're just a bit nuts. So um, she's, she's just been pregnant. Her she's been horm- her, She's got <laughs> her uterus is wandering <laughs> as they do. Yeah, she's got a hysterical uterus. <laughs> so she, her first daughter was born in 1976, Melissa Ann. And shortly after that, Dave number one left her for another woman and took off to Queensland. Yeah. Yes. So shortly after uh, Dave number one left her, she was seen walking down the main street with the daughter in the pram. I think he was about six weeks old and basically throwing the pram around. And as a result, police came and attended. She was taken to the hospital and um, diagnosed with postnatal depression. And so <laughs> she was put in a psychiatric ward oh, for a number no. of for a number of weeks. <laughs> Hormones for the win again. <laughs> <laughs> Prescribe some uh, antidepressants or sent on him there anyway. Oh, uh, so she spent a few weeks in hospital, then she was released. Um, and then Melissa, her daughter, was two months old. And she came out of hospital and decided it would be a great idea to put Melissa on the railway tracks. What? Yes. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> you think about it. You don't <laughs> do it. <laughs> That's right. Well, you fantasize deeply, and then you just nurse them and they go to sleep, and it's fine. That's right. It's just leave that those images for you in your head rather than in reality. In your head, it's like yeah. That's right. She left poor Melissa on the railway tracks. Luckily, there was a gentleman who just goes by the name of Old Ted. So good old Ted found Melissa on the railway tracks and picked her up, and she was saved. So no babies were hurt. In this particular part of the story. This particular uh, <laughs> Okay. Oh, gosh. Yes. Uh, but, I'm um, my wine. but this is, <laughs> <laughs> but this is the crazy part. So, um, so she, after leaving her child on the railway tracks, she was then taken by police again to the psychiatric ward. She opted out the next day. She was allowed to leave the psychiatric ward within 24 hours. What? Yes. Oh, no, no. No charges. I'm not crazy. No. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you're mistaken. Yes, I did leave my baby on the railroad tracks, but it was for safekeeping while I did other things. While well, I ran errands. So, like, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just had to go to the grocery store. I thought it was... Do you guys know if this is a thing? Like, so, so my mum is like an alcoholic. But she, she won't go to rehab, and rehab is in South Africa. It's like a voluntary thing. Mm, so yeah. if she doesn't want to go, she doesn't have to go. So if yeah. you're in a psychiatric ward, isn't that like... Well, okay, I don't know what the, le- the legislation like, was like in New South Wales at that particular time, but I can only speak to these days. that they Police and ambulance um, and hospital staff can take out an order that where you're mandated to mm-hmm. stay. Yeah. Um, clearly that should have happened in this case. In yeah. the States we have what's called the Baker Act where someone else can commit you for 72 hours and they have to hold you for 72 hours. But, like, if you check yourself in, and I know this from personal experience, if you check yourself in for detox, you can put yourself on a Baker hold, but if you check yourself in, you can check yourself out at any time. You're like, oh, actually, I realized I don't have a heroin problem. I need to go home today. And <laughs> yes. they're like... Okay, yes, ma'am, and they just stamp the papers. But if someone else does, it's seventy-two hours, but it's still not. Yeah, and I you're not n- not losing your mind after seventy-two hours. But it's but, just such a reflection of you know um, that women weren't really seen to be criminals. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was either you Something. were crazy, yeah. and obviously you had a like psychiatric there had issue. to be an underlying reason. Yeah, it was because she just had a baby. Yes, and it is. I mean. 
And probably the depression is like no joke, but, but it would be yeah. probably a reflection of child protection services also yeah, at that yeah, time yeah. because yeah. I imagine this day and age, if that was to happen, there is no way that <laughs> she would be going home to that yeah. baby. No, <laughs> yes, she would absolutely. There would need to be a lot of protection and care yeah. put in place. Some shit would go down. So yeah, so she took herself out of the hospital the next day. So the next day. You would think, well, surely she's fixed. Everything's better. Surely she's fixed. It's been 24 hours. Put a band aid on it, all better now. (laughs) Yeah. Had a couple of Panadol and all. (laughs) Um, So um, the next day, she took a family hostage. So there were some neighbors down the road, and she said, Oh, I need to, my baby's sick. I need to, need you to help me to get my baby to the hospital. So the neighbour packed all her kids in her car and drove down to collect Catherine and the baby. This The neighbour's teenage daughter got out of the car to help her get the baby and Catherine pulls out of the baby bonnet. She's sitting on the side of the road, baby capsule kind of next to her, pulls out of the baby capsule a knife and slices the teenage <gasps> daughter on the cheek, <gasps> takes the whole family captive and says that she wants to drive to Queensland and have... Uh, go and find Dave number one, who's off with this other bird. So, um, yeah, so okay. the the mother, the neighbour, convinces her, oh, we need to stop at the service station. We need to stop at the service station. Uh, we need to get a few things before we drive all the way to Queensland. And so when they get to the service station, the mother grabs all the kids and they lock themselves in the office at the service station. <laughs> Catherine. Was there anyone else in the service station? Well, there was the guy who owned it. Yeah. Um, I think he was going, what the hell yeah. is going on? Right. There's a bunch of crazy people yes. in here. <laughs> um, and she managed to basically break into the office. She was just going wild and managed to break into the office. Thankfully, the police had been called. The police arrived. The police fought her off with brooms, <laughs> which I think was a great detail. And really, it's a reflection of the gun laws in Australia. Like, yeah. we don't need guns, we have brooms. We <laughs> should just sweep the hell out of you. Oh, that's sometimes right. Sometimes I think Australia is just absolutely stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but also, can you, like, yeah. I mean, they, they were successful, right? Yeah. They yeah, got her yeah. with the brooms. It's, it's, they pretty much tied her, her out, good. essentially. As an American, I endorse the use of brooms <laughs> in crime prevention. Yeah. And essentially, she just got tired. It seemed like she just got tired of fighting with the police and their brooms. And <laughs> she just, just kind of... She needed to sleep. Don't <laughs> bring a knife to a broom fight. <laughs> I've played knifey broomy before. So... <laughs> So then, um, and and also when the police um, arrested her, she had said that she wanted to actually stop at that service station because the the person at that service station had fixed Dave Number One's car, which allowed him to escape to Queensland. So she blamed the mechanic at the service station for, uh, and that was why she wanted to attack someone there. She also told police that her plan had been to murder her mother-in-law and Dave Number One. And then go find the new girlfriend and murder her too. So, of course, the police, doing a great job, released her into the care of her mother-in-law that she had threatened to kill. <laughs> Which uh-huh. obviously the mother-in-law would have been thrilled with. Totally. Um, and, again, no charges were laid. No charge. Had t- taken an entire family hostage. What? Sliced a teenage girl on the face oh, with a knife. What are you doing? Yes. Fought police with brooms. No when charges. When was this? What year was this? Um, so this was in 1976. Oh, okay. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. it was it was such a low time. Time. <laughs> upon her being released into the care of the mother-in-law dave found out of everything that had happened so left his pregnant girlfriend in queensland and came to her rescue what? yes so he came back to her. How good in bed was she? What What are her tricks? <laughs> I need to talk to her. Yeah. 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 Well, so. No, I don't need to. No, no. <laughs> She's still alive. So, you know, get onto that prison pen pal. Pen pal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on it. Help me. Yes. So, Girl, I'm pretty good, but you got magic. <laughs> uh, so, so she, so by this time she was 21. Uh, and so, so she, wait, wait, wait. yeah, she, she was only 21. Yes. Oh my God. Yes. When all this happened, she was 20. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was awful when I was 22. Not like, I don't even take family. Did you have a broom fight with police? <laughs> Not a broom fight. Not a close <laughs> enough. Cool. Yes. Well, I don't remember my 20s. <laughs> I'm so sure. 
That's Maybe. a really good plea to like. Yeah. And if you ever it ever came back to bite you, I don't remember. I don't yeah. know what you're talking about. So she moved to actually Woodridge in Queensland oh, okay. with her partner. So that's in the Logan area mm-hmm. um, here near Brisbane, yep. and she worked at the Dinmore Meat Works. So she got a job again in an abattoir in Ipswich. So then things seemed to calm down a little bit after that. So 1980, um, her daughter Natasha was born at age 25. Four years after that, um, she left Kellett. So after years of, like, domestic violence that she perpetrated, she just up and left him. So I took all the kids and she moved back to Aberdeen. She's got, like, teen, teen kids at this point, right? Two. Like Oh, only two. Yes. Wait, I thought she had, like, a whole heap of kids. No. So she okay, there's Melissa was her first daughter, and then Natasha was the second daughter. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So she did. She oh, it was the, the teenagers, who, face-slashing teenagers among her. Like, that was the neighbor. Kids. That was the daughter of the neighbor. So she had, like, a whole heap of kids. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm Not her kids. Yeah. Contract. She just had the one at the time of the police broom fight. Just in case. <laughs> um, just in case. Yeah. Yeah. At the yeah. time of the broom fight. Yeah. So she took yeah. off with her two daughters, Natasha and Melissa. Um, she was 25 when Natasha was born and then 29 when she left um, Dave Kellett. She moved back to Aberdeen and she started working in the abattoir again in Aberdeen. And But then she... she loves that bloody abattoir. She really does. <laughs> um, it's all about, all about the knives. Um, so then she hurt her back and she went on a disability pension and she was given a housing commission house. So she had her own place. Okay. And it was very well known when she had her own house set up that that necromania was very apparent because mm. if you if you look up online photos of her house, it's like Ed Gein's house. Like there are just skulls. <laughs> There are skulls and, like, animal skins, and it's almost like a museum with, like, stuffed peacocks and Ooh. wombats and all of these animals that she has taxidermied herself. Okay. It's this, it's just skulls and bones and things everywhere. It's very creepy. It's like a scene from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I feel Massacre. a little nervous about my house. <laughs> <laughs> It's quirky if you're not a murderer to have a house like okay, that. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, in 1986, so at this time she's 31, uh, she meets Dave number two, so Dave Saunders. They moved in together very, very quickly, and uh, I just have to have a warning, and I know that you're all vegan, vegan vegetarian. Uh, 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 no, no, no. Yeah. Anyway, they're... <laughs> I eat blue steak. Yeah, cruelty against animals on this part of the story. Okay, so just cool. a trigger warning there. If, if anyone you. is triggered by this, please skip ahead for about how long? Oh, give me like three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. Yeah. Skip yeah. ahead. So she he kept dingo pups. Mm. Um, so he bred dingoes. So about a year after they met, um, she had this really horrific jealousy that she would have, and her violence just tends. Like it just seemed to increase, increase, increase. So she, in order to show him what would happen if he had an affair, she got one of the dingo pups and in front of him she slit its throat. <gasps> yes. What? Um, and I think Absolutely. it's, I'm one of those people who you can, ha- I can watch a horror movie with like 30 people being horrifically slaughtered. Yeah, one dog. No, I'm yeah. done. I'm absolutely done. <laughs> I, I'm the same. Yep. So that, that was probably the part of, even mm-hmm. though this whole story is pretty horrific, like that was the one part that I just thought. You're like, cut a teenager. I don't fucking care. They deserve it. But the dog <laughs> had nothing to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. Put that baby on the railway tracks, you know. Inside. I can understand how you get to that place, but leave those puppies alone. Um, <laughs> have you ever been around a baby or a teenager? <laughs> the puppies are cute. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay, sorry. No, <laughs> we don't condone violence against children. We don't condone. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, but we think about it. So she also, um, there was a time Often. that she, she also um, knocked him unconscious with a frying pan at a time as well. So she likes it. There was a thing. Yes. yes. The it feels very like a cartoon, doesn't it? Like, I'm going to funk you. Like, isn't that the, like, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was imagining like Road Runner and yeah, like Coyote, Coyote. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, like yeah, yes, I'm exactly. Shaking. Sylvester yeah. cartoons and things like that. Yeah, <laughs> I've got to, I've got to say a, a very quick story quickly while we're on the subject of skillet bashing, because <laughs> um, <laughs> I have one. <laughs> so when I was uh, like a kid, I was living at home with my parents and my brother, and me and my friend Roxy were making pancakes. And my brother came down, and my dad was a chef, and my brother was training to be a chef, and then I later became a chef. But at that time, I was still, you know, practicing and having fun. And um, my brother came down, and he saw this mixture of shit that I'd put in to make pancakes. And he was like, what the fuck is this? 
So he poured it all down the sink um, and didn't even let me make it. And I was really upset. So I grabbed the frying pan, which is red hot, and I picked it up and started running through the house. <laughs> and I was like, you fucking cunt. <laughs> and my mother, at that stage, she was still healthy. Um, and she was coming through the front door. Um, she'd just come back from getting groceries. And she just saw me, like, flying through the house after my brother with a frying pan in my hand, saying, you fucking cunt. And then later, she was like, Jade, do you even know what? Cunt means. <laughs> I, I didn't. I was like, yeah, no. No. So, so yeah, yeah that, that, that happened. Anyway, carry on. That's right. I used to think the F word was fart. So, <laughs> that was yeah, yeah, that's how sheltered my childhood was. <laughs> yeah, so then in 1988, she had her th- third child, daughter Sarah. And so her, she's got a daughter, a son, and a no three daughters. Three daughters. So there's Melissa, there's Natasha, and Sarah oh, right, is the yeah. third child. Perfect. So then she, her and Dave number two bought a house together. One of their arguments, there seemed to be like obviously the escalating violence, and one of the arguments, she hit him in the face with a hot iron. Wow. Um, and then stabbed him with some scissors. So very household item based. Mm. Um, it's. You would think that it's something more situational. So what have I got in my hand? Oh, it's an iron skillet. And and this is kind of, um, I, th- I think this is really the definition of toxic masculinity. I think that what a lot of people, are, like the misconceptions about feminism is, you know, that we think toxic masculinity is mm. something that is men trying to be masculine, where it's actually the way that masculinity hurts men yes so this poor Ugh. dave number two so dave is clearly a victim of domestic Dave's violence. like no it's fine but <laughs> i have it coming <laughs> so his workmates would take bets on what injuries he would turn up to work with like that if that Aww. is not the definition of toxic masculinity i do mm-hmm. not know what is because i cannot imagine as a woman your female workmates betting on what injuries yeah. you're going to turn up with and laughing about it. it seems like it, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't take bets on something without being like, "Ha ha, yeah. you're such a pussy" or whatever. Yeah, like, and it's, it's one of those things that uh, just makes it so much harder for men to come out when mm-hmm. they are victims of domestic violence. So she would cut up his clothes. That seems to be a theme as well: cutting up clothes, burning clothes. Mm-hmm. And so for a period of time, Dave number two went into hiding. So he was the smartest out of all of <laughs> the exes for sure. So he went into hiding and uh, so that she couldn't find him. She was asking around everywhere trying to get a hold of him. No one knew where he was because he was in hiding and he obviously did a very good job of it. But in that time, in that time, she issued out a domestic violence order against him. Uh, so that he, he came back to town. He was not allowed to see his daughter. So, okay. As a survivor of domestic violence. And a person who, yes, I my have. ex, my first husband, who my son has PTSD from this fucking motherfucker, his second wife, second child, all of us have been so traumatized. He continually would use the police and use the system to um, manipulate. manipulate us and yeah. say like, oh, I think she's man- she's molesting my son. He yeah. touches penis. And they would come like, and... Oh, 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 okay. And that's, that's I can't so much talk about it. It yeah. makes me so mad because it actually like diminishes people who actually have domestic violence issues. Mm. Mm. Whether you're male or female, if you use the police, if you use the system, if you use a system that's there to protect people who have experienced domestic mm-hmm. violence, if you use that to further abuse them, they feel you are they a fucking monster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, that is That's the absolute that. worth. Like, ugh. Okay. I, and that is I can't even talk. I'm and it's absolutely, <laughs> like, throughout the pro... And it's, it's really difficult when you piece all the information together um, around her relationships. Her children also try... Like, she has said that all of her partners were violent towards her. Mm. And there was lots of accusations that she had made against people across her lifespan of sexually abusing her. And it's probably true... But it doesn't make it okay for you to do it to other people. But it seems to be, like, um, stem from her childhood. And mm-hmm. it's almost like a reenactment of her experiences. And, mm-hmm. and I always think about Eileen Wernos, who, um, mm-hmm. you know, she was a serial killer in the U.S. who experienced a very, very graphic yeah. sexual assault. And then she almost preempted that every man that she came across was going to assault her. And that was her reason for murdering them. And it seemed to be 
it's, it's a little bit difficult to ascertain. She clearly, so Catherine Knight clearly had quite complex developmental trauma and there was her reliving a lot yeah. of those experiences, but also she was clearly also a narcissist. Well, and you want so, I mean, it's the same yeah. thing. As you want to be sympathetic, like this is not okay that it happened to you as a child or as a, whoever, as an adult or whatever, but also it doesn't make it okay for you to enact it on other people because you're pissed off about it. Like, yeah. I'm fucking sorry. Horrible shit happens to a lot of people, mm. and most of us don't put our babies on the railroad tracks or, like... I've hit one person with a frying pan, to be fair. (laughs) (laughs) I Um, really want to hear that story. (laughs) (laughs) It was what was close. Um, (laughs) But, like, it doesn't make it okay. No, violence is never okay. Um, But, obviously, it was not a self-defense thing for her. And the fact that her previous partners, it shows a similar pattern, which is what we see in domestic violence perpetrators. So... Partner number three, um, John Chillingworth, which sounds like someone not from a small town. That sounds like someone from a small, from an English town or something. Fancy small town. John Chillingworth, (laughs) the third. Um, No, so he was John. (laughs) He was John number one, and I feel I feel quite bad for for John number one. So they got together in 1990. So she was 35 at that time, and a year later they had a son together, Eric. So that was her fourth child. So she had three daughters, and then the fourth child was. Eric. Okay. So they went together um, long before they. No, and that, this seems to be the pattern. They move in very quickly. She gets pregnant very quickly, and essentially, she was also quite violent in that relationship. But she met her fourth and final partner, uh, John Price, aka John Number Two. He um, just sounds scary. Yeah. So he was. Oh, he was not. He was not scary. She. He, she was definitely the scary one in that scenario. <laughs> so she left John Number One for John Number Two. Okay. And left all the kids with John number one. So, <laughs> yeah. John number one's like, oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's now basically been left with all of her four children. So she took up to start. Probably best for the kids. Probably. Honestly, yes. Anyway, so she met John Price. He was the same age as so her, born the same year. He already had three children. Um, he worked at the abattoir. All, no, sorry. He worked in an. He was a miner initially, so he worked, worked in the mining industry. So he had a very good job. He'd been working in the mining industry for seventeen odd years. So he had three kids. Um, his two older daughters lived with him, and then his youngest lived with his ex-wife. So they started out having an affair, and then their um, relationship became kind of official. Nineteen ninety-five ish, and it's interesting. They did an Australian crew crime. Sc- True crime story. Um, <laughs> the on, wine is getting to us. <laughs> <laughs> haven't had that much. You can see this on YouTube and some of the interviews are with his daughters mm. and they talk about how much they liked her and how much they really got along with her, but they all talk about her having this temper. So, and they would have very violent arguments. Um, John was a very, very heavy drinker, uh, and it seems all of her partners were heavy drinkers, but it wasn't until Catherine was in her 40s that she actually started drinking herself. Mm, interesting. So around yeah. 1998, she desperately wanted to marry him, and he just was not having it. He was not interested in getting married, and they had a big fight over him refusing to marry her. So what she did is, and this is, we talk about the manipulation in domestic violence relationships. She, so he had apparently um, been a very good employee, model employee in the mining industry, 17 plus years. But he, as we all, I wouldn't say we all do because I definitely don't do that at work. <laughs> but there are some times that you take things from work that maybe you shouldn't. So he was pilfering. Yes. So he was That's taking. That's a nice way of saying. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> there were so there were first aid kits that had been expired, thrown in the bin, and oh, he okay. wouldn't take them home. So yeah. just little simple things that you know you like might take a couple things. of paper, paper clips from work or a couple of pieces of paper. I don't know something but, like that. So the things in a first aid kit like plasters and bandages they yeah. can expire. Well, um, there is. I think that's yeah. for legal reasons you have to replace the first aid kits yeah. after a period of time. Okay. So they were still absolutely usable, but for workplace purposes and workplace health and safety had to be thrown out. So he'd taken them from the bin. Mm -hmm. So she had this video camera and she loved her video camera. She videoed everything. There's so many videos online of videos that she took even from her 21st birthday party. um, Wait, wait. 
Which would have been like in the 70s, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So she had the little handheld oh, cameras wow. and things. Oh, wow. So she yeah. was like ahead of the game on the... Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. So been a YouTube superstar. So she um, <laughs> videotaped all of the stolen first aid kits and sent the tapes to his boss and to the police. So that was her revenge. So as a result, he lost his job, completely lost his job, lost his pension, everything. And he kicked her out of the house. I had a big fight, kicked her out of the house. And a few months later, for whatever reason, he the decided. The sex thing, right? Wasn't she like Exactly, sex exactly. The, the sex thing, she was this temptress. But <laughs> um, he decided to restart the relationship but did not allow her to move back in with him. And he actually mm-hmm. lost a lot of friendships as a result mm-hmm. um, because they all knew how violent she was and how he was, like, they were not good for each other whatsoever. So there's some reports around this time, and this was in the testimony in her trial, where she actually told some family of her hers that if she wanted to kill him, she would kill him and then she would act like she was crazy um, to get away with it, essentially. And I kind of think, well, like, after you put your baby on the railroad tracks, you really have to act crazy. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, it's pretty established. You've been acting crazy for 20 years. Very much so. <laughs> so February 2000 is where it started to escalate. So they had a very, very violent argument. She stabbed him in this argument. Okay. Beautiful. So, yes. <laughs> you know, like you do. Yeah, so romantic. <laughs> so why wouldn't you have taken her back, really? Ooh, so yeah. then it, the 29th of the of February, so he after she stabbed him, he went to, down to the police station and he tried to take out a restraining order because she was <laughs> had basically moved herself into his house and she was refusing to leave. So he, he was trying to get a court order to get her out of the house. <laughs> okay. Okay, and this is where it's super messed up, and this is why we have domestic violence um, victims who are caught up in the system. Mm-hmm. He was told it would be a three-week wait. So she was, <laughs> so she was her in his house. Like she stabbed him. This is fine. I've just filed suit against yeah. you, but well, this is fine. We'll just share the fridge. It's going to take. <laughs> it's going to take three weeks to get her on out of there. And again, why it's such an issue for men to who are victims of domestic violence, who yeah. aren't taken seriously when, yeah, there, there is clearly... Well, and that's, that's like the across-the-board rule. So that's like from men and men, and men probably have it even harder because the cops, I'm sure, are like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever, you're just mad at her. Like, you know what I mean? Like mm. the, that whole toxic masculinity thing of, like, oh, you're just being a pussy. Yeah. Like, fuck you. Yeah. I'm sure she just... She stabbed me. And they're like, oh, you can't take it? Yeah. <laughs> what are you, a whip? You're not even hurt. Yeah. It's just a flesh <laughs> wound. <laughs> Put a bandit on you. You're one of your stolen <laughs> first aid kits. <laughs> yeah. Flesh wound. Yeah. <laughs> you have like six first aid kits. Just use that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's have a bandit and some Panadol. You'll be fine. Yeah. So this was the 29th of February. So he was told this by the court, went to work, and he told his co workers, if I don't come into work tomorrow, she's killed me. Uh, and. That's what happened. So that night. Is that proof though? Like, I feel like yes. things like that. Oh. Dude. No, no, no. Just, I mean, I mean, like, is that proof that he said that to them? Because I feel like, well, people it, say that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, that was why the alert, the alert the next morning when he did not come into work. That's why it was called so early. Oh, so, right. Yeah. So he had gone back to her after not getting the court order because he said that he was afraid that she was going to kill his children. Oh. So he had said, I've got to go back to her. If I don't go back to her, if I don't go home, she's going to kill my kids. So he went home. Yeah. So the day of the murder, the, in the morning she went to one of her friends who was named Gert, which I feel is a very like interesting Gertrude? name. Or Gertie? Gert. Yogurt? Gert. Who knows? Gert. Gert. Her Gert. name was Gert. Gert. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and she claimed that he had been abusing her throughout the entire relationship. Oh, sure. She's, she's covered in blood. <laughs> <laughs> she is not a bruiser. She's she like, w- he's been hurting me. She went to her daughter, Natasha's house, um, and Natasha had kids of her own by this point, um, and brought the videotape that she loved so much, the video camera, and she filmed what seemed to be this really weird conversations with her and her children and her grandchildren and people have referred to it as like a crude will and lots of um 
things that were very out of character. So saying things like, oh, grandma loves you so much. And they, people said she never would have said those kinds of things. Right. She, I also um, read somewhere else that apparently she had claimed that when John number two would abuse her, that he would grab her by the breasts. And apparently she got her breasts out in front of her grandchildren at some point. And I kind of think if you were the grandkids and didn't remember that, like you wouldn't want that story coming back (laughs) to remind you of what had happened. That's quite bizarre. I I feel like you would remember that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you Mary. Know, that time Grandma got her tits out. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> yeah, it was just really, yeah, very bizarre. Super weird. By that point, John number two had gone home. She had gone and bought herself some sexy lingerie from the secondhand store. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Yes. Mm, that's where I know <laughs> I buy all my yeah, lingerie. So nice. this match something. doesn't quite <laughs> A little worn, a little frayed uh, at the edges. Yeah. I'm sorry. Such an extra sexy. Mm. I really mm. lived in. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I know that I'm, like, shit poor, but, like, I will not wear secondhand. You can get something decent to last you a night from Kane. I would wear a secondhand bra if it was really cute. But panties, probably no. No. I think it was, like, a, a slip, like a tenny kind of outfit. So at least it wasn't okay. underwear. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. We're going to so, go with it was a sexy hoochie coo outfit. That, yeah, that that's it. a great term. Yeah. Hoochie coo so outfit. So she's now, she's been super slinky and That's sexy. right. Yeah, that's right. right. So she can't go, whenever she, <laughs> whoever donated is looking at the news like, fuck. <laughs> that's my <laughs> outfit. Wow. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, she went over to John's house and um, he was asleep when she turned up to his house. And so she's gone in, she apparently watched a bit of TV, as you do, okay. gone in, had a shower, got into her black Hoochie outfit, Ooh. yes, gone in, woken him up, and they've had sex. So after they've finished having sex, he gets up to go to the bathroom, and that's when all terror ensues. I'll just, and remembering she keeps those knives above her bed, mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. So they had sex in the bed that she had the knives in? Oh, Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, they're not going to do it on the. And she already bought a secondhand hand hoochie outfit. They're not going to do it on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so anyway, so I'll skip to. I'll skip through to the next morning because I will discover it along the way that the police discover it. Discovered it. Okay. So the next day, six a.m., the neighbor notices that his car is still in the driveway. Usually, he's at work by that time, so they know after what he said the day before, something's wrong. So they call the police. So 6 a.m. they call the police. 8 a.m. the police arrive. Oh, yeah. So the police have come into the house. They've gone to walk into the doorway into the kitchen. And there's, there's this curtain hanging across the kitchen, and it was quite dark in the oh, house. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Brace yourself. So um, the police officer is to yourself. move the curtain and notice it's quite cold, this very weird material. It's his skin. What? So John Price's yeah, I'm skin. I'm remembering this now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. John Price's skin is hanging from a so hook in the doorway of the kitchen. Like a, like a yeah. leggy I just leg of, curtain. Like one of those, like, tassel. <laughs> <laughs> like a beaded curtain, but a flesh. Oh. No, I think it was just a flesh curtain. Yeah. Oh, and God, people kept referring sick. to it as a pelt. A pelt? I, yeah. Yeah. Colour means a hair. Well, how hairy was he? Was like a, well, if it was my partner, it would be a pelt. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, Mark. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, so they find... Oh, that poor cop is like, bleh. Oh, like, can you imagine of... just trying to push it aside with your hand and like, that's yeah. weird, and look up and like, it's got a face. Like, what? Yeah. Well, no, it didn't have a face because we'll no, talk about where the face skin, is right? a like little he, later on. She skinned it. Yeah, so she worked in an abattoir, so she had all these kind of skills. So they've, they've found <laughs> they skinned him with his fucking hair found, on. And you can see, you can see the um, pelt. The, in, you can see the crime scene photos, and um, in the book of Bloodstain by Peter Layla, um, there's he talks about how the human body has five liters of blood in it. Okay. If you see the blood in this crime scene, you would think that it's everywhere. Like that's that cannot be more than five liters in that house. It's everywhere. So they find her. She's she's a, in a comatose state in the bedroom. She's taken a whole bunch of pills. 
So she's rushed off to hospital oh, in, a, in a coma. Yeah. So she's tried to commit suicide. So the police walk in and what they find is in the kitchen there is on the stove um, a giant pot. Uh, and one of the police officers reportedly said to the other, um, I'll give you one guess where the head is. Uh, and they open the pot. Did he win the bet? Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he won that day. Every like the worst losing. bet yes. ever. This sucks. Yes. So, um, so uh, yeah, so his head is cooking on the stove in a pot. Wait, it's mm-hmm. cooking, so it's still on. So she's taken pills and left the stove it on? Was, well, it was still warm when they arrived. So no. it had been cooking in the early hours of the morning, clearly. So, like, like, um, what, do, you, do you know, like, was the head, like, boiling with with veggies, <laughs> with, with, veggies. Hair, with, with eyes. eyes. I think, she, no, I think, I think she tried to scalp him in the skinning process, but there was like a clump of hair that she could not get off. Nobody wants oh. hair in their soup. No, they do not. Okay, <laughs> I'll take a good head stew, but no. <laughs> no. no. Uh-huh. Hey, uh-huh. what? You'll take no. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So apparently, yeah, really scared right so apparently she also had cooking. Um, so here's your cooking tips, ladies. Um, so it was also cooking potato, pumpkin, beets, zucchini, cabbage, squash, and gravy. That sounds really good. Okay, um, yeah, like as a vegetable. <laughs> um, as a rice dinner. It sounds like yes. it's really lovely, except for the human corn head part of it. Corn beef will never be the same. But also, um, does the human head have that much fat in it? Like you get your cheeks, I don't know, which I, is probably just fat. Well, I think of, I just I remember Hannibal Lecter, and I just think the cheeks, isn't the cheeks a good part? Yeah, but isn't that just fat? Yeah, no, I've never dissected a human head. <laughs> the last time I ate no. I'm kind of glad to know <laughs> that. <laughs> animal cheeks, if I can help it. I mean, but, and you're the vegetarian. <laughs> I love how you're having this conversation. So, <laughs> well, to me, it's all disgusting. So, like, I just, yeah. So she also had, um, uh, so the, the table was set as if it was ready to be served. And at the wow. table, there were two plates set up. With the names of John Price's two eldest children <gasps> sat at the table. Like, so as if she was going ch- to serve. Her children? No, no, no his, his children. His, his adult children. children. So, yes. I just so, came over for dinner. <laughs> so she also, they also found in the backyard a plate that had been thrown out. So it appears that she'd cut off his buttocks. Uh, That's his, the best part I've heard well, from other cannibal things. Well, from what was that plane movie? Yeah, the, the, there are like every cannibal movie. They're yeah. like, eat the ass yeah, first. The gluteus maximus. Um, where part. it seemed like she'd cooked like part of his butt and tried to she eat said, it. Don't take ass eating to yeah. <laughs> I heard she was good in bed, but I didn't know she was like, she eats ass. <laughs> um, and yeah, she had not been able to stomach it and throw it in the backyard. Uh, so it appeared she'd tried to eat him. Uh, um, police found that she he he'd been stabbed thirty seven times and. He'd been skinned and hung from the meat hook. So what they kind of piece together is that she he'd come out from the toilet after going for his pee and she'd stabbed him in the chest um, with one of her knives um, but missed the heart. Mm. And he's tried to climb and get to the light switch and there's kind of – it's clear he almost – he got to the front door at one stage from the blood stains mm. and she's essentially either dragged him back or he's passed out um, and come back and where he's died um, and – there are no defensive wounds whatsoever. So at no time, at no time did he try to defend himself. And the kicker, so what actually got her was that, so he had clearly died at that point. She's actually gone out and taken the thousand dollars out of his bank account. And it was that. Wait, while he was in the house? While he was dead in the house. Yeah. Oh, so she's going to make a quick bank run. Yeah. So she could because she tried to claim insanity later on, and that was the uh, one thing that de, the de, um, the prosecution had was well, clearly you were in your right mind because you went and got cash out. Right. So um, if you're going to kill someone, don't get cash out in the middle of it. Especially, <laughs> hang on, I'm going to come back and finish killing you. Yeah, just do it before him. Yes. <laughs> um, so on his body was found a handwritten note where she essentially accused him of sexually abusing her children, which was also seemed to be a pattern throughout mm. her her history. So she went to court um, and tried to enter a plea, a guilty plea of manslaughter. So yes, I can definitely say see how you'd accidentally stab someone thirty seven times, skin them, and try to feed them to somewhere else. Yeah. Well, that's that was rejected. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, and then she was uh, she went all the way through to trial, and then on the day of trial, um, you know, on the twenty third of July in two thousand and one, she was convicted. She pleaded guilty. She claimed through the entire time she had no recollection of the murder, and still to this day claims she has no recollection that she had this. Yeah, that memory tricks up. Is, that's a good one. Yeah, you're like I don't know, I don't remember anything. I don't remember what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, uh, just yeah. stick by. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm saying I don't remember. I was sleepwalking. Yeah, something like that. I don't no, remember she, lots of things. Like that's what a blackout is when your own brain is like, mm. "Hey, this is embarrassing, and you should probably not remember it." And everyone else is like, "No, it happened," and you're like. Mm-mm. Yes. No, I don't know. And that was a big thing. So psychi- <laughs> this, they had psychiatrists analyze, like, what was happening for her, and all of them said she was absolutely of right mind. She was diagnosed with um, borderline personality disorder. Mm-hmm. But there are lots of people with borderline personality disorder that don't, don't murder be. people. Yeah. So um, she was charged with life without parole. So she was the first woman in Australia to be charged um, and sentenced to prison for life. She was she is currently serving in Silverwater Jail. And apparently, as a little, like, final tidbit, her nickname is Nana in jail. Nana. So, yeah. Oh, and you, kind of see, you see pictures of her, and she kind of, I can imagine her being someone's Nana, which is very You have the jail moms. Scary. Yeah. Uh, that's jail right. moms are important. Absolutely. Even if they're oh, fucking <laughs> oh, murdering. So that is the story of Catherine. Right.